Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. Uh, this is Frederick Winsmith with the NetHope Solutions Center, and uh, we are very proud to uh, bring you yet another webinar, uh, this time produced by the NetHope Crisis Informatics Group. And today we have Facebook talking about their disease prevention maps project. Before we get started, I am uh, going to go over a little bit of housekeeping and uh, we'll pass it on to John Crowley for, from our crisis informat informatics group. Uh, we wanna make this as interactive as possible. So please open your chat window. Uh, you find that uh, little bubble, the third icon to, from the right on the bottom of your screen and follow along the, the questions being asked there and post your questions and we will do a Q&A session uh, for the last 15 minutes or so of the hour. Uh, we are recording this session today, so please look for a follow-up email with links to the uh, posting to the NetUp Solutions Center of the webinar, and that will contain both the slides as well as the uh, uh, as well as the, the recording of the webinar today. Uh, at the end of the webinar, you'll see an online survey pop up in your browser, and we certainly would appreciate you answering a few questions there to help us improve this webinar series uh, over time. And without any further ado, I'm gonna turn this uh, over to John, John Crowley. He is the Director of Informatics Management and Crisis Informatics at NetHope. And uh, John, over to you. Frederick, many thanks. Uh, good morning to everyone, or good afternoon, depending on what part of the planet you may be on. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the Facebook team, uh, which has been putting together this new product around uh, disease, disease prevention mapping. We have been working on disaster maps with this Facebook team for over a year at NetHope, or actually close to two years now. Uh, I initially started working with disaster maps uh, in 2017 when we were launched it in Paris. Uh, over the years, uh, the program has provided privacy control data for emergencies, and it's become very vital for us to be able to provide the connectivity, population movement data, uh, and other information that we can uh, provide to uh, our members uh, via this program. The team has been incredibly responsive. Uh, they've made changes to the, pro to the product. They have uh, incorporated new technology into the overall data analysis platform. And now they're making more data available uh, for disease prevention. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce the three speakers today. Uh, first is Laura McGorman, who leads Facebook's Data for Good portfolio uh, on their policy and partnership side. Uh, prior to Facebook, she held positions in the Obama administration at uh, Department of Commerce and uh, had also worked at OPOWER, World Bank, and USAID. Uh, during her four years at USAID, she worked for the President's Malaria Initiative and supporting the Malaria, malaria Control Programs in Sub-Saharan Africa. Alex Pomp is a public policy research manager on Facebook's Data for Good team. Uh, Alex has led the growth and operations at a, prem a startup called Premise Data and worked on this uh, for six years. Uh, and prior to this, actually, he'd worked for six years leading uh, uh, in Eric's technology for development. He also serves as an IT and education volunteer with Peace Corps in Namibia from 2006 to 2008. Murdad uh, Honecker is a data scientist at Facebook's Spatial Computing Research and Connectivity Teams. Uh, before he joined Facebook, he was the lead for modeling uh, the risk of catastrophic events, uh, including pandemics, as part of, uh, and it was part of the Life's Risk Group worked towards mortality rate projections and structuring stru uh, capital market transactions for life and health businesses. He earned his PhD in geostats from Stanford University. Uh, without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to Laura. Thanks so much, John. Um, so I am going to share my screen, and please tell me if you all can see my slides. Yep. We can. Wonderful. Um, so thanks so much, John, for the excellent introduction, as well as Frederick, for uh, helping us host this webinar. Um, so you have myself, Alex, and Murdad on the line, and today we're going to be telling you about disease prevention maps. Um, the high level, sort of too long, didn't read version of what we're here to talk about is that we've built um, a new set of tools that are designed to improve the way organizations deliver health supplies and respond to outbreaks. So there are a lot of problems we could be solving in the public health space 
we're trying to solve two fairly distinct problems, which is really a health commodity distribution uh, set of problems, and then it's sort of epidemic preparedness and response um, set of problems. The data sources involved in, in disease prevention maps actually include both Facebook and non-Facebook data. Um, this is a pillar of the Facebook Data for Good program and that we believe that it's not only our data that can be useful uh, for social impact in the world, but also our machine learning, our data science capabilities, and our compute power. And so along these lines, we'll be telling you more about a set of high resolution population density maps now with demographic estimates that are in fact built from satellite imagery and census data. Um, and so when you're thinking about this, this set of maps and set of features that we've built, please remember that some of it's built with Facebook data, some of it's built with non-Facebook data, and actually the terms and conditions that apply to um, different maps are, are going to depend on what they're built with. It's also important to note that we're not sharing any health data. Um, health data is very sensitive, as you all know. We also think that uh, groups like the World Health Organization as well as national health systems are still the best place to get information on who's sick. Um, and so what we're really trying to solve for here is a series of gaps in the public health data ecosystem, not necessarily a series of questions about individual health conditions. Um, in terms of who we work with, for the full suite of tools, which includes movement and network coverage maps that are built with Facebook data, we are currently only working with NGOs and universities with a focus on public health. Um, and this kind of work um, requires a data licensing agreement. So for those of you who work with us on disaster maps, uh, the terms and conditions are, are pretty much exactly the same. You would sign, if you're not yet a partner of ours, you would sign our Data for Good licensing agreement and you would get access to a portal called GeoInsights to view uh, maps built with Facebook data. However, um, we have non-Facebook data uh, that we're making available as well as part of this effort, and that's available publicly. Um, so to access the high-resolution population density maps that Murdad will be telling you about, we now have a new page on Humanitarian Data Exchange, and the link um, is actually in the last slide of our presentation. Um, and so we want to make whatever tools for which the data sources are publicly available or commercially available, we're trying to open source those as much as possible. So um, even if you're not a university or an NGO and you're joining the webinar, that's a tool that you can take advantage of. Um, I've alluded to this, but the three major map types included in disease prevention maps are the below. So many of you have perhaps heard um, about our high resolution population density maps. Um, this is an effort that we started with Columbia University in 2016 to build the world's best population maps um, that was actually originally motivated by our work in connectivity. Um, but about a year ago, uh, there was a bunch of us who sat around a table in Dublin and we uh, asked each other some questions about, you know, Facebook has a bunch of data products that we've begun to build. What more do we need to do to make them really actionable and helpful for public health applications. And this was uh, a piece of feedback that we, we got pretty strongly from some existing partners that it's not enough to have maps on population density. If you're uh, working to deliver vaccines more effectively, you need to know the distribution of children under five in a country, or you need to understand if you're doing um, maternal care or antenatal care, you need to understand the distribution of um, women of reproductive age. So we took the original maps, again, built with satellite imagery and census data, not Facebook data, um, and we've now applied a bunch of machine learning to provide an estimate on um, the distribution of certain demographics in the country, which Murda will, will be talking about. Um, we also have movement maps, which look pretty similar to the movement maps that you all know if you work with us on disaster maps. Um, they show movement between either two tiles or two administrative boundaries on a daily basis, and uh, Alex will be telling you more about that. I think the major difference uh, in disease prevention maps with our movement map data is that we're now kicking off movement maps in different parts of the world. Um, so looking at movement uh, in areas where there are ongoing outbreaks of communicable diseases, and we're uh, now generating that data over a longer time span because uh, disease outbreaks tend to last a little bit longer than um, sort of acute natural disasters do, and so the retention um, timeframe and the generation timeframe now looks different. Uh, similarly to our work on disaster maps, we're also kicking off net network coverage maps for disease outbreaks, um, which show where Facebook users have cellular connectivity through their mobile phones. And we hope that this can be used for um, helping organizations that are doing digital outreach for, outreach for public health uh, better reach uh, a community of people who have access to the internet. 
So without further ado, I will uh, kick it over to Murdad to tell us more about the high resolution population density maps, uh, including demographic estimates. Um, thanks, Laura. Um, so uh, to start talking about the methodology, uh, we know that the core of disease prevention are the actions that you know, aim at avoiding the manifestation of disease in the first place, you know, such as immunization and vaccination of children, or even promotions of populations at increased risk of negative health outcomes. So there are two steps required to develop such infrastructure. And the first step here is to figure out where people are. And the second step is to obtain the demographic profiles of these identified people. So if you go to the next slide, um, you see that in here, uh, generally answering the question on where people live is harder than it seems. You know, existing population estimates and census results are too coarse to be useful. So to obtain the population density, we have used convolutional neural networks on high resolution satellite imagery to locate houses and combine those with the best census data sets available. So this produces the highest resolution population maps in the world, like the one that you see here for India, for Madagascar in the middle, and Mozambique on the right. So if we go to the next slide. So basically, uh, the previous state of the art uniformly distributed people over the census area. And this image right now is showing that. And while this captured some of the variations in population density, it was too coarse to be useful. So our project aimed to distribute people onto a 30 meter by 30 meter grid, which you just saw here, which is extremely detailed. So what you're seeing here are the building footprints identified by our models. And this allows us to distribute the population in the census only to areas that have buildings. So if you go to the next slide, you will see that some of the examples of our pipeline in action. So to the left here is the source satellite imagery in a town in India. And to the right, each of those lit up squares is a 30 meter by 30 meter resolution prediction on where people live. So another example in the next slide is a location in the rural Kenya. And notice that it detects isolated houses, which no other data sets can do. And the next slide is lastly, is like a village in Mozambique. And our public population data sets are, according to these things, are now based in the world, especially here in this image, which shown on the rural areas uh, that is overlooked by many other techniques. So now, if you think about it, this answers the initial step towards disease prevention map on where people live. Uh, but that is not enough. You know, if you think about epidemic-prone infectious diseases, uh, the mechanisms to combat these must take gender or age differences into account. And us knowing the dependencies of diseases on such dynamics, we have to go one step further to enable the organizations to identify vulnerable groups or develop appropriate responses. So here we accomplish that by disaggregating data with the respect to the most granular demographic data sets available. And this is a schematic representation of the details we see for South Africa. So having zoomed into that specific part, we can get a better feel on the granularity of the data that we can integrate into our existing models and obtain the most detailed demographic breakdowns by age and gender. So in the next slide, um, you can see just using one of these admin boundaries as an example, we first obtain the proportion of male and female as well as the proportions by five-year age band. So we incorporate 20 categories of age bands, resulting in an overall 40 unique groups of gender and age. So in the next slide, then, when we then go back, we combine these 40 categories of demographic proportions with the population density. So we would be able to obtain detailed spatial differences that exist over various regions in a given country. So thinking about the example on that epidemic prone diseases, we know that there is a strong evidence on the importance of gender and age in transmission and control of those diseases. This way, we can see the 
power and insight that the high resolution maps provide to health organizations to go ahead and improve surveillance, allocate resources, and control the outbreaks. And as Laura mentioned, you know, we release these data sets through um, Columbia University and Humanitarian Data Exchange. So if you go to the next slide, we have combined these like uh, 40 categories into a most relevant grouping such that they are as relevant as possible to disease prevention. And these include all male, which is all of the male from age zero to you know, maximum, and all female, and women of reproductive age between ages of 15 to 49. Uh, we have children under five, uh, according to the, the demographic uh, census data set, youth, uh, which is male and female, 15 to 24 age, and elderly, which is 16, 60 plus. So these data sets are provided in two different formats, such that we can cover various processes uh, that the organizations may be accustomed to, and they come in both CSV and GeoTIFF files. So I'm going to give a brief overview on how to access these data sets, such that uh, all of us can feel the ease by which we can start employing these in our planning. So uh, generally, we start by going to the human, humanitarian data exchange website, and in the next slide, there are many data sets in this platform. And one can search on the top for the word high resolution population density plus demographic estimates. So when we search for that in the next slide, we will see that there is a list of available countries in pages over pages. So as an example, we can pick the second one, which is Zambia. And if you click on that, in the next slide, we see there is an overall list of 14 files. Two of them relate to the overall population, uh, but 12 of them are dedicated to demographic related to disease prevention maps. So if you go to the next slide, uh, as you notice, each file is named according to the six categories of interest that I mentioned, and each category comes in two formats of CSV and GOT files. So in the next file, that means like uh, if, you all, if you download and open the CSV file, they contain three columns of latitude, longitude, and the population for that category of interest. And each latitude, longitude basically represents the center of an approximately a 30 meter by 30 meter area. And this is the high res highest resolution map that is generally available in the world. So in the next slide shows the other uh, possibility, which is a GOT file. And that one, the same similarly, can be downloaded and opened with any GIS tool, ArcGIS or QGIS, which is freely available. And I have given like a, an example on how to import those data sets in the QGIS, which you can always see at the end when we provide the PDF of this presentation uh, available. Uh, so this part is the disease prevention maps. And next, I'm going to hand it off to Alex to talk about the rest of the two data sets. Great. So shifting gears now, we are moving away from data sets that are publicly available and generated with publicly available data sources to those that are generated using Facebook data from the users of the Facebook mobile app. And the first data set in this category um, is the movement of the Facebook users. So these are available similar to the disaster maps uh, by signing a data license agreement. Uh, and if you would like access to this, these data sets, you can just reach out to myself or Laura and we can get you that data license agreement. Um, so if you, there's a lot of utility um, for knowing how people move as this is a, a really important input into predictive models of where diseases might spread. So with the population density maps, we know who and where people are located. But if we know that there is potentially an outbreak in a given region, where is it likely to spread? So Facebook, we are not making any of those predictions. What we are doing is allowing partners to use the general movement trends of our mobile app population to make those predictions. And this can be combined with other data sources that have traditionally been used for this same sort of modeling. So the most common is call records data that can be either obtained um, through partnerships or purchased from telecom. 
Um, also, some researchers have used Twitter's uh, Geo API to, to begin to predict uh, the spread of humans. But the, you know, the penetration of Twitter is widely variant across countries, so th that utility may be limited depending on the type of disease uh, you are studying. And then lastly, there's traditional survey data like census which would be asking people, you know, this is your home location, but where do you travel to go to work? What is your commute like? And then those can be aggregated to try and create, uh, you know, movement uh, inputs for predictive models. So the Facebook uh, movement data, um, it's, this is a very complex data set. So rather than looking at static values on a map, we are looking at a vector value. There is both a start point and an end point for the movement track. So there's a direction and also a value to this. And it can be either positive or negative. And the other thing to note is that our data sets currently for movement are generated not cumulatively. So you are not, uh, as you would like, look today, tomorrow, the next day, we are not adding up, oh, 10 people have moved, now 50 people have moved, now 30 people have, or now 100 people have moved. You are just getting snapshot views of that movement each time that you, uh, we generate this data set, which is once every eight hours for 90 days by default. So here are some other parameters that define our Facebook user movement data sets. Um, those of you who have been working with the disaster maps uh, will recognize them immediately because they are almost entirely the exact same data pipelines in use. The only thing that we've changed at the moment is that they are generated now by default for 90-day periods since disease outbreaks are typically longer prolonged response efforts compared to uh, acute natural disasters. The geospatial resolution is the same. It's a 0.6 kilometer square tile that this is resolved at. And our anonymization and aggregation methods are also the same. Um, and this is more or less the same technique that's employed uh, on census blocks, where for any um, shape where there is under 10 people, we would not generate the raw counts because the, to, to reduce the risk of re-identification of unique Facebook users. Um, and a small amount of random noise is added to those raw counts as well. However, um, what is retained is still the same uh, notion that there is an acute moment when the data is generated. But we need to be very careful here. That makes sense for a disaster where, oh, an earthquake struck at this time or uh, a cyclone hit at this time. And then if you are looking at percent change of movement or uh, the number of V-score variants that we would see, that has meaning for a natural disaster, but it rarely has meaning for a disease outbreak scenario. We're working on improving and simplifying this to avoid confusion, but for now, please be very careful when you are looking at aggregated statistical metrics related to movement of percent change in Z-score. There isn't really a moment when a disease outbreak hits. So if you're looking at percent change before and after, the concepts of baseline and difference uh, probably have no meaning. So uh, I would caution you uh, in using those metrics. So here's um, an example of what these vectors look like when they're laid out on a map. Um, the term that I often use is that this looks like spaghetti noodles. Um, so this is a very complex series of movement vectors. Um, this particular map and the underlying raw data is currently used by uh, disease modelers who are trying to predict the spread of an in a potential influenza outbreak in the UK. And similarly, um, there's researchers that are initial partners who are using this movement data that was generated um, also as a result of the recent tropical cyclone Fani that landed uh, at the border of India and Bangladesh. Um, but again, we can see a really rich, robust uh, cross matrix of movement, both between and away from uh, city centers. So now uh, to give you a sneak peek, we recognize that these data sets, they might look impressive, but pulling specifically operational meaning from them is almost impossible. Uh, it, it just looks like a, an impressive map, but what are you actually going to do with this data? So 
an improvement that we're going to make to the visualization of this very complex uh, sea of vectors uh, I'll walk you through now. So this is currently what you would see for the movement map around Harare. Um, and again, we're, it's just kind of lines interconnected, not pretty difficult, even though it's simpler than the previous examples. What exactly is going on here? This is the visualization method that we will be moving to shortly. Um, so we have the ability to uh, more clearly see both inbound and outbound movement and actually filter in both directions. And we have a bar chart on the side that helps us make sense of the relative scale um, and, and the difference of the movement that we would normally expect in this area. Um, the, this new visualization will also allow drill downs. So when you click on the different town names or the different arrows, it will surface the exact metrics that are being shown and visualized there. So this should help, um, one, make sense of a much more complex data set and also aid in kind of hypothesis forming for, uh, before you download the raw data set and use that as an input into your models for predicting the spread of disease. So um, stay tight. We understand the problem. We're working on the solution, um, and, and we hope to release this soon. So then our third and final map uh, that comprises the disease prevention maps product is a look at the network connectivity of Facebook mobile app users. And again, this is available only through uh, the partnership of signing the data license agreement with Facebook. Since it is generated using Facebook users' data, uh, it is not made pu fully publicly available. This is quite familiar to those of you who have been working in disaster maps for some time. Um, what we do is by looking at the per package performance between Facebook mobile app users who have location settings enabled, we are able to give a model for the expected uh, coverage of 2G, 3G, and 4G bands, again at a 0.6 kilometer square geospatial resolution, updated every eight hours. The caveat here is that we are only able to resolve and model the network connectivity for telecommunications infrastructure in places where there are Facebook mobile app users who have this location settings enabled on their device. So for example, here in Eastern DRC, um, for those that are studying the outbreak of uh, Ebola, if there are no Facebook users in a place, that does not mean there is no connectivity. We are only giving you our modeled interpretation of connectivity where we have users available to act as sensors on this. And the hope is that by looking at uh, our user network's level of connectivity, you're able to determine who you might be able to reach with messaging via WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger or any other messaging tool if you're trying to reach them with health messaging hey, we have bed nets available. Uh, we will be bringing them to this location at this time. Or hey, we have this medicine available or this vaccine available. Who will you be likely to reach with that message if you use digital channels? And who might you be missing? Um, that's the purpose of providing this data. So now back to, uh, to understand the parameters I've more or less said this. You'll have this PDF available for reference after the presentation. Um, but these are just the parameters of the generation of this data. And yeah, to close this out, I'll just walk through a few case studies. Um, so Disease Prevention Maps officially launched on May 20th alongside the World Health Assembly, which was uh, barely you know, a week and a half ago. Um, but we have been doing some work um, before the official launch with some of this data. So we have some initial case studies, although we do believe that the lion's share of the impact is yet to come. Um, so one example of how our high resolution population density map can be useful for commodity distribution um, comes from Malawi. And in the case of Malawi, the American Red Cross and the Missing Maps program used our high resolution population density maps to identify areas with and without concentrations of people. So as it turns out, our maps revealed that um, the landmass of Malawi is actually 97% uninhabited. And so when they were working to do house to house sensitization for vaccinations, they were very quickly able to filter to the areas where healthcare workers should be targeting so that they could deploy their network of 3000 healthcare workers to deliver vaccination messaging more efficiently as part of that measles campaign. 
Um, what's exciting again about the demographic estimates is now you will not only be able to filter on where there are people, but where there are likely high concentrations of children under five. Um, and this is helpful not only for knowing where to focus, but also knowing areas not to miss. Um, what we've anecdotally heard is can be very powerful about our maps is because they identify structures. Um, it's very helpful to know that there can be a cluster of, you know, two to three houses in a remote community somewhere in, in Malawi or, or DRC. And so in addition to showing where to focus, it can also make sure that you're not missing houses, which is really important in something like a measles vaccine where you need 95% of children under five vaccinated to achieve herd immunity. Um, another recent use of our high resolution map, which um, John participated in, as well as some of our collaborators um, from Direct Relief and Harvard School of Public Health, was to use the high resolution population density map for Mozambique as an input for um, initial model based estimation of cholera. Um, so as many of you know, through working with us on natural disasters, um, Mozambique has been hit terribly by subsequent natural disasters, first Cyclone Edai followed by Cyclone Kenneth. And with the rise of flooding, there is um, significant rich risk for a cholera outbreak. And so this team of collaborators came together to try to put together um, a forecast on where cholera outbreaks might occur. And this was published in a blog by Direct Relief and then the uh, methodology was open sourced on GitHub. So again, we're working here through our partners to make um, as much of the, the learning here um, as broadly shareable as possible. And that's another way in which um, our high resolution maps can be leveraged. Last but not least, um, I'm going to draw from a network coverage example um, that actually comes from disaster maps, but we're hoping that um, applications in the public health space will look very similarly. Um, so following the eruption of the volcano in Guatemala last year, um, UNICEF, who operates a tool called U-Report, which is built um, almost exclusively on Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp, uh, they were concerned that if they tried to do a digital outreach campaign that they wouldn't actually reach that many people. But after confirming with our network coverage map that the density of 2G and 3G networks was much broader in the areas affected by the hurricane than they had anticipated, they actually realized that U-Report could be a very valuable tool for outreach in the aftermath of the hurricane. So as a result of using our network coverage maps, they conducted um, an extensive advertising campaign on Facebook directing communities towards U-Report. Um, and they generated 3,000 more users who then received information on uh, their smartphones about what to do after the eruption, which included information about health services, when it was safe to go back to school, what shelters um, pe people could receive additional services at. Um, and again, this allowed them to reach the maximum amount of beneficiaries at the lowest possible cost. Um, and just to close things out, uh, just to remind you all about where you can get some resources following this webinar. So, as Murdad referenced, all of our high resolution population density maps are available on our page on Humanitarian Data Exchange. We actually have an organization page, so all of Facebook's data, if you want to just find it in one place, can be found at this URL. Um, for those of you who are working with Facebook data, we now have a new help page specifically designed to help you better understand uh, disease prevention maps and the use cases associated with those, and you can find that at facebook.com slash help slash insights. We also have a Data for Good website, which if you're new to sort of working with the Data for Good team at Facebook, this is a really good one-stop shop for understanding um, the breadth of the areas in which we work. Some of the, uh, the questions we get are whether or not we work on, on issues related to refugees, issues related to migration. Um, and uh, the Data for Good website does a really good job of explaining the verticals in which we operate as well as the tools we make available. So if you have questions on like, is this something your team does or not, I would recommend um, taking a look at that website as a, as a first place to, to better understand the scope of our work. And for those of us who are, again, working um, as partners, working with Geo Insights, we have a Slack channel. Um, we try to keep things out of email because um, we want to be really responsive to you all. We understand that in certainly cases like natural disasters, but also in disease outbreaks, we want to make sure that the updates you're getting are timely. And we also want to make sure that uh, as we do this work, we're building an actual community across partners that we work with. And so we found Slack as a very useful tool for that. So our channel is fbdataforgood.slack.com. And if you're not on our Slack channel, Alex um, can send you an invite. So that concludes our presentation. And Friedrich, I will pass it back to you for um, walking us through Q&A. Excellent. Thank you very much. This is a lot of information to uh, uh, digest, and I'm glad we're 
recording this and uh, able to uh, post the slides a little bit later. So um, in order to, I'll just go through the questions as they've been coming in um, and encourage everyone to use the chat window to post additional questions. Um, the first question that came in was uh, similar to the disaster maps. Does Facebook need to like, turn on the data capture or the collection process? And if so, what triggers such an event for the disease prevention maps? It's a great question. Um, so right now, as many of you know, there's two ways a disaster map gets generated. Some is through this automated pipeline that's built off of an international alerting framework that um, we in integrate with that basically says, you know, when an earthquake is, has recently occurred or when a hurricane is about to make landfall, we can also kick off bounding boxes manually um, based on our partners' um, request. If, and this typically happens if it's a smaller scale natural disaster that isn't picked up by our automated pipelines. Right now, um, the main method through which we kick off uh, disease prevention maps is through that manual bounding box generation. So you would basically, after signing a data license agreement with us, you would email myself or Alex and say, we want to study um, you know, a measles outbreak in the environs of Paris. Could you draw a bounding box that you know, covers Paris and the, the neighborhoods therein? And we would say, sure. Um, the main restriction there is that we can't generate bounding boxes for like, you know, the entire continent of Asia. The, you know, the Facebook data, we need to be very mindful of generating it only exactly where it's needed. And so those are typically subnational bounding boxes. Um, however, we are working with our team who manages the backend pipelines to potentially move to um, an automated disease prevention map generation, similar to the way we work in disaster maps. During this pilot phase, I think the manual uh, approach is working pretty well because we also want to make sure we're not generating, you know, 50 uh, disease prevention maps a day. That would be overkill. Um, but we are looking to you know, sort of the sensitivity and specificity of existing alerting frameworks for disease outbreaks that we could also leverage in an automated fashion. Great. Uh, John, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, this is John Crowley calling uh, from NetHope. Uh, I'll try and run through some of these questions since we've uh, we've worked through quite a bit over the couple of years trying to uh, uh, hone down this process of working with Facebook. One of the questions that's emerged is um, really the the provenance of the data and how where does the demographic census data set come from? Um, what's publicly available? What's not? Uh, if you could go a little bit further in the, into depth into that, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so I'll take I'll take a first stab and then Murdad, if I if I miss anything, you feel free to jump in. Um, so in almost all cases, the demographic source data is coming from the most recent census. Um, and so you know that's a frequent question we get is that if the census was a few years ago or more than a few years ago, how reliable um, are the population estimates? And that's sort of a noted gap. Um, what we do do with uh, Columbia University is that. Um, if census data is really bad in a country, we will often rely on other sources, the UN population estimates, things like that. But we rely on Columbia University, um, who has sort of more population uh, estimation experts and mapping experts to tell us which population data set we should be leveraging for each country. So it's not uniform. Um, and again, that is the major data set that we make available publicly um, because there is, it's, the source data is essentially publicly and commercially available data. There's nothing um, unique to, to Facebook and its users about those data sets. What is not publicly available for this project are the movement and network coverage maps, which require a data licensing agreement. Um, so if you have any questions, you know, feel free to email myself or Alex. We're happy to sort of explain a little bit further. Um, for those of you who have gone through the data licensing agreement process with us, um, hopefully you found it fairly lightweight. We try to keep the legal pieces of this puzzle fairly straightforward because our goal here is to get insights to the organizations that need them and not spend you know, six months in contract negotiation to work with you all. So we use a two-page click-through agreement that is um, able to be signed online. Um, and we try to keep the term standard across all of our partners so that we can actually scale this work to as many organizations as possible. I have to give a huge plus one to the uh, the use of the click-through agreement. Uh, when I was at IFRC, it took months to uh, work through a custom agreement, uh, and that process now has become much more streamlined, uh, which parallels much of the work that the team has done as this continuous improvement on, on the process. Uh, the other thing that I'd love to, to highlight here, the, in, in diving into these questions, the 
connectivity maps have been critical for NetHope for our network planning. Um, in no other way are we able to get information that quickly uh, to our members or for our own planning to be able to uh, figure out how to reconnect sites and exactly where things have uh, been hardest hit. Uh, but one of the more uh, dynamic areas of the tools that have been available to us has been this movement. And uh, I think there are, uh, this, this new format is, I think, going to make a big change. But there are some questions here in the chat window around it, particularly versus on cumulatives versus time period movements. Um, could someone explain the, the, how to be able to calculate cumulatives uh, based on those eight-hour uh, slices that we get? Sure, yeah, I can take that. Um, there's kind of the, the, the main way I would uh, suggest is that on the, the tool in which you are able to access the movement data once you sign the data license agreement, there's a download feature so that you can look uh, at the raw CSV of these files, and then you can create uh, using you know, Python or R, like any scripting language, or even in Excel, you could generate the, the cumulative totals then. We also are working on improving um, a, a derivative data set that's called displacement. So rather than being a vector-based uh, measurement, this is uh, a single value at a, a location for each administrative region, what the current uh, difference in population is compared to baseline. But again, because the disease outbreak scenario doesn't have an acute moment uh, of onset, uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense methodologically. So we're trying to unpack how we might be able to make the data both more accessible but while still being statistically relevant. Unfortunately, we don't have a way of kind of allowing you to decide when you want to make that, uh, like for a cumulative measure, what time period you want to select other than downloading the raw data at this time. Um, and I think there's quite a few partners on the Slack group who are willing to share uh, either their scripts or uh, their approach with Excel in order to do that, since we know like use cases differ slightly, um, both in terms of the geospatial aggregation across tiles or within administrative boundaries or within different time ranges. So right now we kind of give you everything and we hope that you can figure it out. Uh, and then in the future, we hope to like produce functionality to allow those use cases in our tooling, um, but that's still to come. I guess two follow-up questions on this. Um, oftentimes, the time period of which the data is available for disease is very different than for disasters, uh, particularly with longer incubation periods or a disease that has a small pocket uh, that then spreads later. How far back can this data be made available for a disease outbreak? Can it be rewound if uh, a researcher finds a particular need or is hunting down a hypothesis? Yeah, rewinding the clock is very difficult. So Facebook, uh, as a, uh, an overall arching policy, um, we do not retain any lo like location data that is this specific and granular longer than 60 days. So we're only using the 60-day window to establish kind of like the baseline when we're making changes and things as it relates to a natural disaster. So it. Well, this is a common question because, you know, theoretically, it, it could be, you might think that Facebook, you know, has all of our location data and we never get rid of it. Actually, for privacy preservation and, you know, just like good data stewardship, we do not retain that. So we don't really have the ability to rewind the clock. Uh, if you need data in a certain place, it's probably best to, like, kick off the boundary box after signing the data license agreement. And then you as a researcher, again, you're able to export this raw data and, and build it up over time. But that isn't something that Facebook we do. Um, it, it's, again, it, it's data stewardship and for privacy reasons. So. Yeah, but to clarify, we have extended the data generation window. I think I covered this in the beginning, but right now disaster maps run for 14 days, which some of the very early feedback we got from disease prevention maps users was that was way too short. Um, for anything related to disease prevention mapping. And so we now generate movement and network coverage for 
disease prevention use cases for 90 days. Um, as Alex mentioned, there is still this baseline movement data, which doesn't really apply in the case of a disease outbreak, but that also can be used as sort of a directional understanding of in the month or so prior to the bounding box being generated, what did sort of average mobility look like um, before you've kicked off the bounding box? But the short answer is, tell us as soon as you need the data, because that's probably the, you know, time equals, uh, T equals one is going to be as best as we can do. We can't really go back in time. Um, another follow-up question on this deals with uh, the administrative boundaries. Um, what we often find during disasters is they change, um, or we add in admin three or admin four uh, based on different, uh, I'll, I'll say, constituents having a, a say into which uh, which boundary set or which official boundary set uh, a particular response needs to use. Uh, while we do have the, the grid squares, um, how do you deal with the uh, changes to admin boundaries? What's uh, Facebook's policy for interacting with these uh, sometimes dynamic changes uh, to, the, to the admin boundary polygons that we have to use? Yeah, I don't think I have a very good answer for that, so I'll definitely parking lot that and get back to the group. Um, we don't have really the, the the definition or like the the admin polygons that we're using, I'm not aware of like a dynamic process by which those are being updated, especially and certainly not as it relates to like an ongoing crisis situation. Um, the documentation on which admin boundary level we use is available in the help documentation. Um, the and that's more or less static, um, and I think. What a lot of users do is the, the tiles, then they aggregate uh, in their own G GIS workflow into the specific polygon boundaries that they have as most relevant. So again, we're kind of passing the buck down to you all since you have kind of, we're, we're trailing our best to support a wide range of use cases. Um, so we kind of, as a safety precaution, move back towards like the more raw data and then you're able to, to generate your kind of custom data sets uh, as need be. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, a new question, a new thread is looking at current outbreaks. Uh, you've worked with the Malawi out, uh, measles uh, vaccination campaign with uh, American Red Cross. Um, I know measles is actually a fairly large issue here with our anti-vax movement in the United States. Are you working on anything actively in the U.S. on measles? And more generally, what, what outbreaks are you currently uh, working on? Sure. Um, the short answer on the measles U.S. question is no, but that's because uh, we haven't identified uh, a partner yet who is working with mobility data to do epidemic forecasting around measles. Um, but if anyone on the line knows of one, <laughs> please let us know because that's the whole purpose of this webinar. Um, where we are looking initially at measles outbreaks um, is with London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, who has some interest in looking at the recent outbreaks in France. Um, so we are certainly taking a look at whether or not our mobility data um, can be helpful in the measles um, sort of prediction space. Uh, we have a number of, of sort of pilot partnerships. We're working with London School also on a set of questions around um, the spread of flu in the UK, looking at a bunch of different diseases in the Asia region with Harvard School of Public Health who's interested in forecasting dengue um, as well as chikungunya. Um, they also have taken a sort of like an ex post look at what some of our movement data for Puerto Rico um, tells them potentially about um, sort of morbidity and mortality in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Um, and we're also looking at things like cholera in um, Harare, um, a number of outbreaks of malaria across Ethiopia. So I am going to not be able to remember all of them off the top of my head, but suffice to say, we have a number of sort of nation partnerships looking at different types of diseases um, around the world, uh, cholera, in, uh, sorry, TB in, in India as well. Yeah, face, Facebook, we are not making any choices on which diseases and which locations. We are entirely demand driven by, by partners um, and we're always looking for new partners, uh, NGOs and researchers. So that, that's constantly fluid. We aren't deciding where and when we, we are responsive to whatever you as the partners would like to investigate. Yeah, I hope it goes without saying that we just want to make sure that um, 
you know, our data sets are useful. For, so, for example, in the aftermath of the launch of this tooling, people have reached out to us about things related to opioid addiction. And it's not that Facebook doesn't have, uh, you know, a vested interest and, and care about opioid addiction, but mobility data isn't super helpful um, for solving that problem. And network coverage data, I would argue, probably isn't super helpful either. And so, typically, what we're going to say yes and no to is really just a question of whether or not our data can can actually help solve the problem. I, I, one question on this is, is uh, I think, getting to something that uh, a person has asked here on the on who is counted in this data is when to use it, because since someone does have to have both the app and the location on, there are certain countries where a disease outbreak may happen where um, the Facebook data may be gold because huge adoption of Facebook uh, and the data is incredibly representative. Um, there are other countries where that's not the case. How does a researcher um, approach this challenge uh, in using the data? Yeah, this is a really common question. So um, the high level answer on sort of an initial take of uh, representativeness that we've done is that we did an analysis with Stanford University to overlay the high resolution population density maps, which now you all know are uh, built with census data and satellite imagery with baseline statistics from um, GeoInsights. And so what we're trying to figure out is, at least from a spatial distribution uh, perspective, are uh, the data points that we see in a disaster map, or in this case, a disease prevention map, do they sort of match or fit the spatial distribution of a gold standard population density map? And what we found was that pretty much everywhere but Sub-Saharan Africa, the goodness of fit was really high. Um, so I would, I would suggest um, as sort of a first rule is if you're thinking about a disease outbreak in Sub-Saharan Africa and you know it's a place with really low connectivity, um, our data might not actually be very helpful. Um, we're still going to kick off a bounding box for you. We're not going to say no, but um, it may be that, you know, you might want to interpret that bounding box with sufficiently more, you know, caveats and caution than you would a bounding box in Indonesia or Europe or LATAM. I would also say that it's fairly obvious once you look at the data. So for those of you who have used our maps for Cyclone EDI as an example, um, we tried to use our movement, movement data uh, to inform that cholera uh, forecasting exercise that I mentioned to you all, and the data was just simply too spotty. Well, I mean, it, took, it took looking at it for five minutes to recognize it wasn't going to be a useful data set. And I would say that it's actually uh, fairly intuitive once you take a look at the map. Um, once you see the N <laughs> that you have available and, and you sort of juxtapose that to the total population, um, you can sort of use a, an educated um, set of perspectives and use your judgment to determine whether or not you think it's going to be a useful um, data set to leverage. But I would also say as a final thing that, you know, we never suggest using Facebook data in isolation. So the partners that have worked with our data for the longest period of time are going to use Facebook data as a layer, but they might also use a ton of other things. Um, from other administrative data sources to better understand Facebook data in context, and we always support that as well. Great. There's, a, I think, one other question here. Uh, many of these, these issues emerge on the Slack channel, and there are ways to begin to uh, work across multiple organizations through that uh, venue, and I, I think we, we do touch on that. Uh, but one other question this year is what GIS tools? Um, do you see being used to analyze and, and integrate this data with those other data sets, uh, particularly the, uh, the ones that are going to probably either show the representative data, data or begin to uh, create models or other uh, analyses that get us to some kind of decision point? Uh, the, the, the data sets um, for movement and network connectivity are surfaced in a geospatial tool that Facebook has built uh, for as an internal tool. Um, so it's kind of a custom solution. It's called Geo Insights, um, and you can download the data through that um, either like in a CSV or a GeoTIFF format. And from there, it's really kind of up to all of you. Um, we're not really we we have people in house like Murdadas and others who are GIS experts and so each of them has kind of can give you some level of help or support on like the workflows that they typically work within. Um, like Jupyter notebooks are quite common in things, but we're not really prescribing that. What we're hoping to do is be making our data available in formats that we're not, you know, locking people into a particular GIS workflow. Um, it, it's 
pretty much, you know, the ArcGIS and QGIS are, are the ones that we hear about the most, but I think a lot of our users kind of have their own custom uh, workflows that are, and we want to make sure we're supporting as many of those as possible. So if you see limitations to your workflow in our current setup, uh, that feedback is very valuable. So please email or, or Slack me uh, so as we can better support your workflows. Now, if, you're, if the request is that you would like an, like an API or something, that is something that isn't possible at the moment due to, to privacy concerns. Um, so the, the download feature and a bulk download feature that's currently available in Geo Insights is, is the best we're able to offer at that moment uh, to, to support your custom workflows. Thank you. I'm going to pass this back to Frederick in one second, um, but I do want to say uh, this Facebook team has been incredibly responsive to requests. Um, they've worked overtime, late hours, weekends, and making it possible for us to use this data during emergencies. Um, so I, I do want to thank them for their incredible efforts in making uh, a sometimes difficult set of data uh, available under strict privacy controls uh, to the sector. Uh, Frederick, I think we probably can close this from here. And uh, th th thank you. Thank you very much for Laura, Alex, and Murdad uh, for taking the time to talk to us this morning. Yeah, I want to echo that. Uh, thank you also to you, John, for producing this uh, series with uh, Facebook. And Laura, Alex, and Murdad, uh, thanks for super valuable information. Uh, I have posted your contact information in the chat window so people can go back and look at that. Uh, there will be a follow-up email with the link to the web page where we're going to have both the recording and the slides posted uh, later on today. So keep an eye out for that as well. And uh, keep an eye out uh, on the events uh, side of the NetApp Solutions Center for upcoming webinars uh, in this series and on other topics as well. So. Uh, with that, um, please uh, consider answering the few questions to the webinar satisfaction poll. And we look forward to uh, meeting you again, seeing you again in these webinars uh, going forward. So have a great rest of your day, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.